This morning, let's draw our attentions to Psalm 147. Psalm 147. My goodness, we got four more psalms left here. And it's exciting to be here, uh, you know, in this amazing uh, book and closing it out. But this is a great psalm because remember, last week we, or the last time rather, we started in Psalm 146. The last five psalms, including Psalm 146, they close out uh, the final volume, which is the fifth volume in the book of Psalms. And these are the psalms that are known as the Hallelujah Psalms. These are the praise psalms. And the book of Psalms really closes itself out in this anthem of praise. This anthem of praise. Very encouraging to see and know that the Lord can be trusted and relied upon and we can look to him. And this is kind of how this book culminates because it has a lot to do with the history of God's people from the very beginning. We've seen uh, psalms on creation and also the attributes of God and the faithfulness of God. We also seen psalms in which the Lord gives justice to his people and deliverance and also that he will deal with the wicked and the unrighteous. But then we also seen how God dealt with his people Israel. His people that he chose, and we see many passages in the psalm that deal with that, and then how the Lord brought them throughout their history, and then how the Lord blessed them, and how his word fulfills his purpose. I like Psalm 147. Reason being is because it reminds us of the faithfulness of God's word. So jot that down, the faithfulness of God's word. The psalmist titles the psalm here, Praise to God for His Word and Providence. The word providence means kind of a going before, a going ahead of, if you will. And providence, really, when we speak of this term, the providence of God, it has everything to do with God's actions beforehand that will ultimately fulfill his purpose. The providence of God is the very thing that we look to when we see stories about the Lord, like, say, for instance, the story of Joseph. That is a clear picture of God's providence. And why? Because what it shows us is God's providential care with his people. We look at Joseph's story and we say to ourselves, as we're reading through the book of Genesis, how is it that this story can turn out for good? Remember there in Genesis chapter 50, Joseph looked to his brothers and he says, hey, what, what, what the enemy intended for evil, what you intended for evil, God turned out for good. Well, that really is God's providence. That in the end, all will work out according to his purpose and his plan. And remember, all that God does is good. Well, this is kind of how providence works. Joseph's life is a perfect example of what the providence of God is. So we look at the circumstances. We know that Joseph was surrounded by some brothers who didn't really care about his visions and dreams that he was having. Especially when he told them, you guys are going to be worshiping me. But anyways... We know the story that ultimately his brothers then sold him, um, you know, as a slave. Uh, his father was lied to about, uh, you know, where he was and what happened. They said that he was mauled and, and eaten and taken by wild animals. They brought his coat of many colors. They put blood on it. And so the, uh, his father believed it. And for all these years, he believed that his son Joseph was killed. And, and uh, we see that Joseph then was a, a slave, uh, really, uh, you know, a prisoner, uh, a servant, a slave. That's what he was sold as. But then ended up in, in prison and we see that no matter the circumstance that he was in, God raised him up to positions of prominence, even in his suffering. So from the very beginning, we see that Joseph suffered. And what he suffered was because the call of God upon his life. And it's an amazing story because we see that ultimately in the end of the story, Genesis 50, you find that the amazing thing about the story is what Joseph what the Lord had showed Joseph ultimately came to pass. And Joseph understood very well that if he would have not have been sold by his brothers, and if he would have not have ended up where he ended up in Egypt and in the household of Potiphar to begin with, then thrown in prison, raised up in the prison, and then became second in command in Egypt because God gave him favor there. Uh, and we see all of this. Then a, a drought 
what God seen, man didn't see, and a drought and a famine that would be coming to the land. And this was the vision and the dream that Joseph interpreted, that there would be seven lean years, and then there would be seven years of famine. And then his word uh, in the interpretation of this is store up for the seven lean years. That way, when the years of famine come, we'll have enough for ourselves and those around. Well, we know the story to be true, that then we see that Jacob sends his sons out, right, to go and get food, and, and they go as far as Egypt, and then guess what? Joseph recognizes his brothers and then they got food to take back home and nobody dies from the famine, you know, nobody. Well, then you look at the end of the story and you realize that you might say how cruel are his brothers? Probably pretty cruel, but how amazing God's providence that even in Joseph's suffering, God was at work, sent him to Egypt beforehand so his family wouldn't die in the famine. Isn't that amazing? That's God's providence. You see, and we can get fixed and caught up and focused upon all the details of perhaps his suffering and think to ourselves, you know, wow, this guy really had it bad. But God was serving a greater purpose behind the scene. Well, this is what Psalm 147 is all about. It's a psalm of praise to God for his word and his providence. That in other words, all things are done according to his word and ultimately are fulfilled because of his providential care. You know, in the same way, the word providence, as it declares, and it means to go before, the Lord also goes before you, and he goes before me. He goes before us. God has providence in our lives as well as children of God. And there's ways and manners in which God works. And that's why a lot of times we don't understand what the Lord is doing. And at times we might not like the experience that we're having and the things that we're feeling in our lives, but we know that God is in control. God has not given up control. Man at times thinks God has with statements like, God, where are you? Where were you at this time or that time? He's always been there. And though there's a statement that it goes in some way, and I'm paraphrasing the statement in and of itself, when, when the world seems that it's out of control and all authority has been given up. There's one behind the scenes who has not given up his authority and is still enthroned, and it is the Lord God. We can rest assured that there's this, this greater picture behind the scene. This is what Psalm 147 is all about. So what is the backdrop of this psalm? This is what I think is amazing about it because we do have some context. This psalm, most likely, because of what is being said in verses 2 and 3, And on down uh, in verses 10 and 11, and then also in verses 19 and 20, this would seem that this psalm is what we call a post-exilic psalm. Exilic means from the word exile. Remember that the children of Israel, uh, the people of Judah, were exiled. Remember that? They were taken captive by Babylon, 586 B.C., And then a decree goes forth about some 50, 60 years later, right, by Cyrus. And then the temple is not rebuilt till about 516. So you have the period of time from which they were taken exile to the time in which the temple was rebuilt and the time of captivity was over, which is a period of 70 years from 586 to 516 B.C. And Jeremiah the prophet prophesied that there would be a time frame of 70 years of captivity, but yet the Lord would set his people free. Isaiah prophesied that Cyrus would be the one who would give the decree for them to go and rebuild the temple back in the land. So this is the backdrop behind those. And the celebration here really is a celebration in regards to those that came out of the captivity. But the idea behind it is praising the Lord for keeping his word and his providential work. Because God said that he would do this. The Lord even spoke concerning their captivity. But he also spoke concerning the freedom of the, from the captivity. He spoke about a time in which they would come back into the land and that he would restore all things. As a matter of fact, we also see that in the scriptures, the Bible says that the Lord would then rebuild and restore. Did he not say that? There was a promise given in Daniel's day who was the prophet during that exile. And remember, Daniel in Daniel chapter 9 talks about a day in which a time where the, where the walls and the gates would be restored at Jerusalem. 
But we know that that didn't happen in Daniel's day, but it did happen not too long after that in the days of Nehemiah. And Nehemiah was a man that God had used to rebuild the walls at Jerusalem. We have the historical account, not only in the book of Nehemiah, but also in the book of Ezra, as we see under the leadership of Zerubbabel, that the people were brought out of the captivity, and Zerubbabel brought them out at the decree of Cyrus. When you look in the book of the prophet Isaiah, you'll see when Cyrus gives the decree, or Isaiah prophesies that he will give the decree, there in chapters uh, 44, 45, and then you begin to see all of this come to fruition, because what you find with the prophet Isaiah is he's saying, the Lord is faithful, he will keep his promise, and he will sustain his people, and God is working behind the scenes in all things. And it's an amazing thing because there's an invitation at the very start of the psalm to praise the Lord because he's faithful at keeping his word. Look at verse 1. It says, praise the Lord. I like this here because with these three words, we know that really this is where you get the word praise the Lord. See, we say it in three words, but you can say it in one. It's the word hallelujah. If you look at the word here, praise, it's halal, and the word Lord is jah. There's your word, hallelujah. And so this is how the Hebrew people would phrase this. And this is why they call these the Psalms of praise. It's a collection of praise. And they're saying, praise the Lord. But notice that's the start of the psalm. Notice the end of the psalm, once again, is praise the Lord. The bookends of the psalm is that the Lord is worthy of our praise. So we look at this here and the psalmist draws this attention. So with the term praise the Lord, it's a declaration and an encouragement for his greatness and his sustaining power and also all of his creation for his grace. And notice that the Lord is gracious, healing those that are afflicted and also strengthening those and giving them his word. That's the idea here behind this term, praise the Lord. When we look at the psalm here, we'll see that there are, as some would say in a song, there are stanzas. There are three stanzas here in this psalm. The first is found with the words here, praise the Lord in verse one. The second is found in verse seven when it says, sing to the Lord with thanksgiving. The third is found as we're wrapping up the psalm here in verse 12 with praise the Lord, O Jerusalem. And after each stanza, we see the need and the reason and the encouragement as to why we will rejoice and praise the Lord. You know, guys, one of the greatest things that encourages God's people is reading through the Psalms because these are people who are very much like us with needs in our lives and circumstances surrounding us. But yet we see how the Lord at the start of some of these Psalms, as we've read in our time, that the people started off. It was kind of difficult, rough, but then the Lord would encourage them by meeting their need in some small way. And then the psalm would start with, God, where are you and why is this going on? And then it ends with a, so a, a song of praise. Lord, thank you, bless you, hallelujah, praise the Lord. And here the psalmist is saying this entire psalm is a psalm of praise from beginning to end because the Lord is faithful from beginning to end. He says, praise the Lord, for it is good to sing praises to our God. For it is pleasant, and praise is beautiful. Now he's saying there's a couple of things that take place here. Three things, jot it down if you're taking notes, and that is this. That it is good, that it is pleasant, and it is beautiful to praise the Lord. Why praise God? Because it's good. It's good to give credit where credit is due. Isn't that what the scriptures say? Give honor to whom honor is due. If the Lord has been good at some point in our lives, we're to say, praise the Lord. We are to give credit where credit is due. Honor where honor is due. You see, I think the psalmist is building this up. There were three rounds of praise as we look at the stanzas. And in these three rounds of praise, round one, he's saying, praise the Lord because he is the one who restores his people. Nothing else restores like the Lord. He's the only one that can take us out of a very difficult situation, restore us, and then use the testimony and witness and the power of that restoration to declare his goodness and faithfulness in our lives. 
This is why many of us, when the Lord works in our lives, we might not feel it at times. We might sense a little bit of being different than what we once were, but others see the work better than you do. And they come alongside and they say, you know, you're different. You got to give God credit for that, please. Say it's all him. It's his goodness and faithfulness. As a matter of fact, it's because God's faithful at keeping his word. He is the one who restores. So he's saying it is good to sing praise to our God. It's a good thing. Our life is often riddled with bad things. Can I get a witness? Bad choices. Can I get a witness? Okay, good. So we agree. But in praising the Lord, it's never bad. To praise God is good, even when bad happens. Isn't that what Job said to his wife? Should we only be thankful because God gives us good? We should also rejoice when God gives us bad. The Bible says it rains on the just and the unjust. How can we rejoice in times of difficulty, guys, keep in mind that 70 years of captivity, the people could not see the end in sight. It took Daniel, the prophet, in Daniel chapter 10 to read from the scroll, the Bible says, reading from the prophet Jeremiah. And it was there that Daniel realized that the captivity would soon be over. It was in the encouragement of the word of God. Now listen, if it took Daniel that amount of time to find it in the scroll and read it, how much more the people who were living in Babylon, taken captive, not maybe having the access that Daniel had to the word of the Lord, but them wondering, how long is this going to be? Or are we ever going back? Keep in mind, guys, listen, when you read the book of Ezra, I think it's amazing that you'll note something that happens. The people begin to cry when the foundation for the second temple is laid. There's a reason for that. There's a group that's rejoicing and there's a group that is weeping. And in the book of Ezra, it's an amazing thing. We've already studied it in detail, but, but I go back and I read it again because it's very encouraging. The group that was praising and rejoicing were all those that were born in the captivity. They had never been to Jerusalem. They have never seen the beloved city. They had no idea with their own eyes what the temple of Solomon looked like, the place where the glory and the presence of God dwelt. All they heard was stories from the generation that was taken captive. Oh, the days of Jerusalem where we worship the Lord God, where his glory would fill the temple. And, and, and they're explaining all of this. Why? Because they were not doing any of that in Babylon. And when they came into the land, that generation that heard those stories, what did they see? They saw a city that was besieged, its walls torn down, its gates, the temple destroyed. And when the foundation was laid, they rejoiced because now they were going to have their testimony and their witness of seeing God's power, the stories of old that they heard. But the older generation wept. The Bible says they wept because... The foundation was nothing like the former glory of Solomon's temple. They knew that it would never be the same again. They wept because they knew what the glory once was before they were taken captive. But the young generation that was born in the captivity, well, they rejoiced because they said, even though it might not be the same to us, it makes no difference. This is new. God's doing something great. And to both groups, both young and old, the Lord was being faithful to his word. And the people rejoiced. And this is the backdrop behind what's taking place here. That God is good. It's good to sing praises to our God. Then he goes on to say here that it is pleasant. Psalm 135 and verse 3 speaks of how pleasant it is to praise the Lord. It says this, Praise the Lord, for the Lord is good. Sing praises to his name, for it is pleasant. Sing praises to his name, for it is pleasant. The Bible also says that in praising the Lord, it's not only pleasant, it's beautiful to praise the Lord. Sometimes we need to make sure that what we do to the Lord represents him well. There's beauty in praising the Lord. The Bible says here in Psalm 33 in verse 1, it says, Rejoice in the Lord, O you righteous, for, for praise from the upright is beautiful. 
who are the upright, those who are righteous by faith and obedience in their walk. It's a beautiful thing to praise the Lord. Guys, listen, you know, I know sometimes it's probably a beautiful sight to see people praising the Lord, and it's amazing, right? Amazingly beautiful. And all we see is man standing with hand, hands stretched up and out before the Lord in singing, but God doesn't see the physical posture of man. He sees the condition of man's heart. Hands might be stretched out, and voices might be singing, but Jesus says, they honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. You see, God knows the heart of man, how beautiful it is when the heart is in tune with what is taking place outwardly. You know, a lot of Christians live their life this way. I know for years I've always preached a message on living for God and don't compromise. And I've always been hard on sin and, and I've been called a Pharisee and I've been called being judgmental and, and Pastor David is legalistic and, and that church, there's no love there. And, and you know, and if you mess up, oh, you really blew it and they're gonna tear into you. And I've heard it all in all the years that I've pastored the church. But you know what I know? I know my heart and I know I'm never pleased with it. Because I know how quickly it is for me to live a religious life rather than a spirit-filled life. God's not coming back for religious people. That's why many will be left behind. Many people who raise their hand and put countless hours in service in church. Many pastors and ministers and Bible study leaders will not make heaven their home. You see, the interesting thing about this whole dynamic is that when one praises, he praises the Lord because of who God is and his faithfulness. But the beauty of praising the Lord is those who are upright. Those who are upright. And remember, it's the Lord who sees the heart. It's the Lord who sees the uprightness of heart. This is why at times when I see, you know, people say, oh, let's go to these concerts. You know, the worship leader is coming into town and people literally go, do you know how many people there are not right with the Lord? They believe they are. They truly believe with all of their heart. Now, I know what you guys are going to say. You know, oh, there you go. You know, uh, you know, you're judging people. No, I know the heart of man because I know my own heart. And it is deceitfully wicked. And I'll tell you guys what, a heart that is in tune with the word of God. Some people call it legalism. Some people call it being letter to the law. Some people just say, you're just too religious. No, listen, if you love God, you fear him and you obey his word. It's as simple as that. The word says it, do it. Do it. The one who hears the word and obeys it when he praises, the Bible says, listen, guys, it's beautiful to the Lord. Do you guys not want to do things that are beautiful to the Lord? Do you not want to do that? Of course you do. Well, guess what? We think that it has to do with, you know, hey, well, well, come and help me with this project here. It'll be beautiful to the Lord. No. The Lord is saying, your heart is a project. And the beauty of worship is a heart that is in obedience to the word of God. So it is pleasant and it's also beautiful to praise the Lord. I think he begins to build up the reason why. Why is it good? Why is it pleasant? And why is it beautiful? Look at verse 2. The Lord. Everything is directed to the Lord. And not only is it the Lord, but he begins to speak about his actions. What he does, he builds up. Look at that in verse 2. Look at the, 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 the middle part of verse 2. He gathers. Look at verse 3. He heals the brokenhearted. He binds up their wounds. Verse 4. He counts the number of stars. Look at this. He calls them all by name. Verse 5. Great is our Lord, mighty in power. Look at this. His understandings are infinite. Isn't this amazing and remarkable here? That this is the God who we are given the privilege to praise. Should we not praise him from our heart rather than our outward actions? 
What is a heart that's obedient to the word of God? It's not tradition. It's not religion. Guys, listen. It's being true. Being, listen, you, you know, listen, guys. Some people say, oh, I know they love God. They're always at church. I, I don't do that. Why? Because people can be mechanical at what they do. You could just set it in your heart that, you know, I need to be there. There's people that are faithful at this. And, 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 and you know, that doesn't necessarily mean they're closer to God. That's the misconception that people have. But the very fact that God is all of this and then some and he invites us to praise him from a heart that is upright before the Lord. This is what makes praise beautiful when it's done from the heart. You will see what's in the heart of man as they continue to live for the Lord by how they deal with circumstances and situations and things they go through throughout their time on this earth. Did you know that? Did you guys know that a good way to look at your Christian walk is this? The mistakes you make are for the purpose of correcting before he comes back. Oh, I want to be, I want to be. If I were to ask everybody in here right now, and this is sad, if I were to ask everybody in here right now, who wants to be closer to the Lord? Who wants to be a better man or a better woman of God? All of you will raise your hand. It's a desire that we want. Here's the problem. We desire it, but we don't do it. Desire doesn't get you into heaven. Desire doesn't make heaven your home. Desire doesn't make you closer to the Lord. If we just desired that God would send a Messiah, and we just, God, you, just, you need to do it. Come on, Lord. I'm with you. If you do it, I got your back. Is that, is that going to get you into heaven? No, it's not. But if the Lord sends the Messiah, right? And you say, it's not a desire. It's that I know I need. I'm not just going to sit here and say, hey, I want it. No, you go and you chase after it. And how many of you guys know that at times desires, they're, they're very tricky, right? We have desires that we know are not of the Lord. Amen? Good. We do. But the Bible says that God puts desires in our heart. Those are the desires that are honoring before the Lord. But to sift between those, at times our hearts deceive us, right? Well, prayer is an act of the heart. And it says here, it's because of who the Lord is that we have this privilege to worship from an upright heart. Look at what he says. The Lord builds up. And the Bible says in Psalm 127, in verse 1, what does it say? Unless the Lord builds the house, the builders labor in vain. Unless the Lord builds the house, the builders labor. In other words, there are builders and they can build a house. But if the Lord's not in it, if he's not the center, the focus, the reason, the means by which all this comes together, then it's in vain. When it comes to the context of God's people in verse 2, the Lord builds up Jerusalem. Of course, why? Because man cannot do what God can do. The Lord promised that he would build Jerusalem up. Ezra and Nehemiah are the historical accounts. And as he gives these three commands given here to worship God in verse 1, in verse 7, and in verse 12, guys, listen, each of them are with reason. The Lord is the one who restores his people. In God's amazing grace, he built up Jerusalem. He built it up. The rebuilding showed that he is God and that he is a God who will, not can, but who will restore those who repent and turn to him. And the ones who repent and turn to him, listen to this church, they're healed and they're restored. The Bible asks this question. Verses in the scriptures in Psalm chapter 20 and verse 8. Psalm 146, in verse 9, it kind of gives us this whole idea here. Actually, in verses 8 and 9. The Lord deals, yes, with the wicked, but, but is anything too difficult for the Lord? Isaiah chapter 40, verses 6 through 29. Is anything too difficult for the Lord? No. He can do it. He gathers together. This is interesting. You see here the word gathers is the same word that's used in Ezekiel chapter 39 and verse 28 as it deals with God gathering his people from the captivity. 
So we know the captivity is in view here. He gathers together the outcast of Israel. He heals the brokenhearted. Psalm 107 and verse 20 in Isaiah chapter 40. He heals the brokenhearted. He binds up their wounds. The word here for wounds is sorrows. He counts the number of stars. Listen to this. And he calls them all by name. Great is our God and mighty in power. Guys, listen. The one who is creator of all things and in control of the galaxies. Listen to this. And he counts all the stars and he numbers them and he knows them all by name. He heals the brokenhearted. In Isaiah 61, we know the passage. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me. Jesus reiterates this in Luke chapter 4 and verse 16. And in the same way, Jesus came to heal the brokenhearted, to bind up their wounds and to make that which was bad and wrong, good and perfect in the sight of God. God is the one who restores his people. The one who created the galaxies and knows every star by name heals his people. That's an amazing promise. Heals his people. Great is our Lord. And mighty in power, the creator sustains. This is why I like the verse, you know, where, where Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 4, he talks about, uh, you know, committing our souls to a faithful creator. So what he says, he says now, verse 19 of, of 1 Peter 4, he says, Therefore, let those who suffer according to the will of God commit their souls to him in doing good as to a faithful creator. Why as to a faithful creator? Because the creator knows what his creation needs. And so the psalmist goes on to say here, his understanding is infinite. I love that. God is infinite, we're finite. I remember when I first heard that years ago. I'm talking maybe like 20 years ago I heard that statement. And I'm like, what does that mean? It's exactly what I said. I'm sitting in a lecture listening to uh, Dr. Robert Morey. And he's talking about, you know, that God is infinite and that we're finite. And I'm like, wow, you know, those, to me those were very big words. What does it mean? That time, you know, you didn't have quick Google like, you know, we do now. You know, it's like, but... But I'm sitting there and I'm like, wow, you know, this is interesting. So he says, let me describe the statement I just made. He says, you know what a thimble is, you know, when you're sewing, you put it on your thumb so you don't poke yourself. He says, you guys know what those are. And he did like this. And everybody's like, yeah. He's all, well, that's your brain. <laughs> and he says, and God is the ocean. Infinite, finite. Take that little thimble and try to fit the ocean in there. Is it going to happen? It's like, no. God's infinite. We're finite. Now, we look at this and we say, yes, God, that's amazing. But the Lord is saying here, the one who created that ocean that is infinite. The one who created the galaxies, the stars, and all that is in it, and all that our eyes see, he is also the one who restores our heart. Guys, your pain, somebody wrongs you. One little wrong. Say they call you a bad name. Other people would tell you, get over it, right? Suck it up, right? But it hurts you. You know what God says? He doesn't get behind you and suck it up. The Lord says, I can heal that hurt. As infinite as God is, he cares about the details and the most minute things in our lives. The things that pain our heart draws his attention. And in his greatness and his creative infinite power, God uses that very same power and strength to heal the very smallest sorrow and deepest pain in your life. I think that's amazing. That God, even though he created all things and he created the world, that same power in his creation is the very same power that he uses towards you and me to fulfill his purpose and his plan in our lives. And the things that you think that are insignificant to the Lord are very important to him. Why? Because of you. And this is what the psalmist is saying here. He says, do you understand? We can't even begin to kind of grasp and put the two together. He's saying, think about this for a moment. 
Can I encourage somebody here? You will be healed. Because the Lord heals. However that looks, you will be healed. He calls them all by name. Great is our Lord and mighty in power. His understanding is infinite. The Lord lifts up the humble and casts the wicked down to the ground. I'm so thankful that he does that. Amen. You don't got to waste your time, church. He got it all under control. He even has the wicked in check. Psalm 104 in verse 35 says, May sinners be consumed from the earth, and the wicked one, or the wicked be no more. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Praise the Lord. You know, we don't often do that. We don't often do that. We're, we're living in this, what we call this dispensation of grace, and the encouragement and the reminder is go and tell people about Jesus. Go and win the sinners. But the psalmist just said in Psalm 134 and verse 35, Hey, the sinners, you know. Take them out, Lord, and the wicked. There should be a, a prayer of God's righteousness. There should be some imprecatory praying in our prayers, praying that the justice of the Lord would take place. We know that God is faithful. He lifts up the humble. What does the Bible say? What does Peter say? That God resists the but he gives grace to the, yep. The Bible says, humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and in due time he will exalt you. Look at this. The Lord lifts up the humble. You guys know that this is what God desires to do for us? He casts the wicked down to the ground. This is kind of how he ends verses one through six and he's saying here, guys, listen, the round one, okay? Everybody say round one. He says, praise the Lord God, the one who restores his people. And look at what he's saying as he just kind of closes this stanza out. He says, the Lord lifts up the humble. He casts the wicked down to the ground. He's encouraging them and reminding them that the one who created all that they see, heaven and earth, created them. Second stanza here. The command to praise the Lord, we see here, he says, sing to the Lord with thanksgiving. Sing praises on a harp to our God. He, he calls them to praise the Lord musically. Listen to that. And here he reminds them that this is the one who restores their land. This was huge to the people, right? They came back and what did they find? A city ravaged by Gentile kings and kingdoms. Sing to the Lord with thanksgiving and sing praises on a harp to our God who covers the heavens with clouds, who prepares rain for the earth, who makes grass to grow on the mountains. He gives the beast its food and the young ravens that cry. He does not delight in the strength of the horse. He takes no pleasure in the legs of man. The Lord takes pleasure in those who fear him, in those who hope in his mercy. Remember when they came back into the land, boy, they came back to fields unattended, right? They had a lot of work to do. It wasn't just the walls at Jerusalem. It was their land. And you want to know what? They came back and they probably cried and they probably said, Lord, how are you going to fix this? Anybody ever felt like that before? How, God, and just weeping. And the Lord, listen, what did he do? He covered the land with clouds and brought rain. And guess what? The Lord provided once again their fields had crops. The Lord restored their land. Remember, remember in the book of Leviticus, the Bible says these two things about God's people. Number one, the people belong to God and so does the land. He created his people to dwell in the land. It all belongs to God. But, but here's the whole point, that they could trust the Lord even with the necessities and day-to-day -day needs. And he's saying, praise the Lord. He's like, hey, take out your guitar and sing a song. Praise him for his provision. He brought rain. The idea here in verse 9, when it says, and he gives 
the beast its food, listen to this, and to the young ravens that cry. The idea behind this is, you know, kind of in Jewish thought, ravens were abandoned by their parents. They were, they were, this is Jewish thought. They were, they are abandoned by their parents. So they're birds that are abandoned as babies and they go out and scavenger. This is, they go out and they have to, you know, scavenger, look for food. And it's saying here that even the ravens were taken care of by the Lord. The idea and the picture is kind of themselves, right? Being abandoned, they felt. But it wasn't abandonment. God wanted them to abandon their idols. But they cling to them. And this is what separated their fellowship. And, and like the raven who are out there having to, for 70 years, having to scavenger throughout, guess what? Then the Lord brings food and he meets their need. If the field, listen to this, if the field yield its crops, then their cattle eat of the grain, then the people eat of the field and their cattle. And what the Lord is saying is, you don't even got to worry about it. I got everything under control from beginning to end. God, you brought us to a deserted place. It's not a deserted place. It's my place. What makes it deserted is that my presence no longer dwelt there because you had no desire for it. But the Lord is saying, whatever land that you and him had when you came to faith, if it's deserted, the Lord's saying, come back to the land and watch what I'll do. I'll provide that latter rain. I'll provide the rain. I will, I will put my spirit in you. And, and those times of, of reading the word and looking to the Lord for provision and, and resting in him for his sustenance, the Lord is saying, they will come because I will restore the land. He goes on to say here that it's important for them to trust in the Lord. He says he does not delight in the strength of the horse, not man's abilities. Look at that. He takes no pleasure in the legs of man. You know, I, I think this kind of goes back to what I was saying earlier about those who are his and not his. We rely on the strength of man. Well, I know I'm a Christian because I No, We know we are Christians because of Jesus. Everything goes back to the cross. So then you say, well, then why do we do what we do? We do what we do in gratitude and thanksgiving because something has taken place in here. We have been taught religion for a hundred plus years in this country. A relationship with Jesus, very hard to find in the body of Christ, the so-called body of Christ today. A love for his word, a love for fellowship, a love for being among the body of Christ, a love for, you got all these, it's interesting because listen, if you go back a hundred years, I, I challenge you guys to do this, go back, here, here's one thing that hasn't changed, you ready for this? Right here. This hasn't changed, but if you go back a hundred years and read material written by the greats of our, of our, you know, era, if you will, right? The Spurgeons. We all heard of Charles Spurgeon, right? We all heard of, of, of all these greats, Luther, Calvin, you know, um, and, and we have all their study material, John Gill and Arthur W. Pink and, and all the greats of within the last hundred years or so. And we read all their writings. You guys know that there's not one book written on spiritual burnout. Hello, somebody. There's not one book written on why a pastor should take a sabbatical. There's not one book written on why it's important for you to take time off from ministry. That's all just been recent. And the reason why the church is sick and the reason why people in the church are sick with their walk with the Lord and they're not strong spiritually and things come and they hit their life and they come all undone and then the church says, well, yeah, they acted out of character. Look at what they went through as if it's okay. No, it's not okay. How is it that very few can stand when they're being sifted? Because they haven't given in to the abilities of man. You might say, well, how much can you take as much as God gives you? A 
I believe it was A.W. Tozer who said, God, before God can use a man greatly, he, God, must hurt him deeply. Oh, but, but nobody wants to get hurt. You want to write a book on burnout and take a break and a sabbatical so you don't get hurt. You see, the whole point here is the Lord is saying, do not trust in man's abilities. Now, let me say all this to close this out on this note. I want to be honest with you guys. You do whatever you want, but I don't read those burnout books. I don't read that junk because it does nothing for me here. What I want to read is biographies of the greats that prayed that trusted, that served the Lord God all their lives. In this day and age, I've only had one example, well, really two in my life. Two people in my entire life that lived the Spirit-filled life from the very moment that I met them to the very moment that they stepped into eternity. The first person was my grandmother. She was a woman of God. Didn't fear nothing knew the Bible, could preach a sermon better than most ministers that minister today and most theologians that write books today. By far, she blew them out the water. Studied her word every single day. And Pastor Chuck Smith. Served the Lord faithfully. The night before he passed away, he was preparing his sermon for Sunday on a breathing machine, oxygen, cancer riddled body. That Tuesday, he had a board meeting at his house with all of his board. All the way to the very end, serving the Lord. Some people say that's a bad example. Pastors should retire. You never retire. Your life's no longer your own. You retire when he takes you home. You see, I like reading the writings of old because they never gave up when things got tough. They just said, Lord, should we only rejoice when we get the good from you? What about the bad? Let's rejoice in it. Continue on. Do not trust in the strength of horses, nor take pleasure in the legs of man. Why? Because the Lord takes pleasure in him and those who fear him and those who hope in his mercy. Do not take no pleasure in man, but rather take pleasure in the Lord. And you know what the Bible says? That the Lord takes pleasure in us. Do you want to please God? Fear him. Fear him. Don't let no, don't fear nobody else. Don't fear public opinion or what people are going to say. Fear God and walk in the fear of the Lord and watch what God will do. Can I tell you guys this? You know what I tell people? This, this is what I tell them. They say, how often do you preach on uh, tithing? I'm asked this a lot, not by other pastors. Hey, bro, how, often, how, how many times uh, during the week in all your services do you pass the plate? I said once on Sundays. And, 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 and how, how, how often do you preach on being faithful and committed to ministry and this, 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 and that? And, and I says, well, I don't set sermons aside just for that. What are you asking me? He says, it's hard to get people to commit and be faithful. I says, well, here's what you're not doing. You're not preaching and teaching the fear of the Lord and on sin. Because a person who walks in the fear of the Lord loves God so much that to ask them to be here early, to be here committed, is never a problem. It's the least they can do for what the Lord has done for them. There's something about the fear of the Lord. There's something about walking in it and being thankful that, that we could trust in the Lord God and regardless of what's taking place, God is faithful and that we can say, as we fear him, we hope in his mercy because he is faithful. With this, the Lord finds pleasure in us. We become now instruments. Listen to this. We become instruments that bring God pleasure. How many of you guys have hurt people before? Raise your hand. Okay. How many of you have kind of been the source of someone's hurt where they see you and they say, all you've done is brought pain to my life? It's true. I, I've, 
come on now. In this, in, in, if you've lived long enough, hello, have you really lived? Not sheltered like a hermit, you know, but, but literally lived life and had encounters with people. There's just some people that just feel like, you know, you just hurt me too many times. But listen to this. How often do we hurt the Lord? And the Lord is saying here, here's an opportunity for you to bring pleasure to me, not be the source of hurt. Bring pleasure to the Lord. I, I think, I don't know, just that thought that's put there. Let's move on now. We've got to close. Here we go. Praise the Lord, O Jerusalem. Praise your God, O Zion, for he has strengthened the bars of your gates. He has blessed your children within you. He makes peace in your borders and fills you with the finest wheat. Trusting in the Lord. Look at that. The one who declares his word and keeps it. The one who restores his people. The one who restores the land. The one who declares his word and keeps it. In verse 12, it says, praise the Lord. <clears throat> Commends them to congratulate the Lord. O Jerusalem, praise your God, O Zion. For he has strengthened the bars of your gate. Well, we've seen this in the story of Nehemiah. He has blessed your children within you. He makes peace, shalom, in your borders, in your city, in Jerusalem, and fills you with the finest of wheat. The Lord gives them the fatted wheat, takes care of his people. What is this all a result of? The one who restores his people, the one who restores the land, and the one who declares his word and keeps it. Guys, do you know that this is it? The word of God. We can trust in the word of God. He sends out his command, his word, to the earth. Guys, listen. His word is fulfilled in the earth. I think this is an important thing. Listen to this. His word runs very swiftly. Remember what Paul the Apostle said in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 1? He prays that the word of the Lord would what? Run swiftly? Maybe he had Psalm 147 in mind. But what is he saying? That the word of God can be trusted. He gives snow like wool. He scatters the frost like ashes. He casts out the hail like morsels. Who can stand before his cold? He sends out his word and melts them. He causes his wind to blow and his waters to flow. In other words, what is he saying? He's saying the word of the Lord is fulfilled. He controls all by his word. Hebrews 1.3 says he sustains all things by the power of his word. God controls the weather by the word. The word controls all things. He declares his word to Jacob which are his people, Israel, his statutes and his judgments to Israel. He has not dealt thus with any nation. Notice, did he give any other nation his word? No. And as for his judgments, they have not known them. Like creation, as we started, like the weather, like the animals, the cattle, how they all obey his word. Creation obeys, the weather obeys, cattle obeys. What is he saying? So should his people. They should obey his word. What did the Lord tell Samuel in regards to Saul? Obedience is better than sacrifice. May we be obedient. May we stop saying, well, I'm here, aren't I? Well, I've done this. No, listen, that should come out of gratitude and thanksgiving. Why? Because you're not on your way to hell. It's the least you could do. Whatever we do for the Lord, may we be a pleasure to him. Like he says, here's your opportunity to shine. Verse 11, the Lord takes pleasure in those who fear him. He has not dealt with any other nation this way. And I thank the Lord for the people of Israel. They preserved the word of God. Remember there in Lamentations where like the word of the Lord is lost, but no, it was found and it was read in the hearing of the people, right? And Josiah was like, the people need to hear the word. The word had been preserved and they preserved God's word. And the church today preserves the word of God. We are to take the word of God out and we are to, to declare it. And we are not to say it out of knowledge. We're to say it out of a heart filled 
fear before the Lord and saying, this is our God and this is who we worship and this is who we praise. Why are you so excited about the word of God? Because he keeps his promises to the very end. He's faithful. He's faithful. Guys, listen, if, if, if you had a check waiting for you right now after church, like your boss came and, and he's like, I got, you know, a hundred, two hundred thousand dollar check for you. You just so, did so well. You'd be in here like excited. Can't wait to say, you know, like, hey, my boss is outside. You know, it's like you probably wouldn't even be taking notes. You'd be like, can't wait to get out there. You know, the boss is out there and you'd be like, such a great boss. It is so great. <laughs> it's interesting how we give credit to man when the Lord says, don't do that. Do you guys understand how rich you are? Oh, well, it doesn't feel like it, Pastor Dave. Well, we don't serve God by feeling. We serve God by the truth of his word. Praise God for his word and providence. Do you believe the word of God is real? Do you believe that it's true? I know you guys do. You're eight o'clockers. <laughs> but listen to this, guys. The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 25, the word of the Lord endures. Rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord. Notice what the psalmist says. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. His mercy endures forever. His word is faithful. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord.